memories of Watsonian cricket by a former team manager. I've been involved in sport in Scotland for around 60 years, principally rugby, a few years in field hockey and latterly cricket. I have performed various roles, all under the umbrella of volunteer, but my main involvement and interest has been in dealing with on-pitch injuries. I've never played a game of cricket, but I've taken an interest in it since my teenage years, initially through the now defunct Cooper Cricket Club and the farming habit of long lunch breaks, which allowed me to watch England test matches on black and white television. Much more recently, in 2004, I was having a chat at my side with James Henderson, the excellent and long-standing South African Watsonian professional, who suggested that I become involved in Watsonian First Eleven in a non-specific team manager role. I explained that my knowledge of cricket was limited and the finer points of the game something of a mystery. Notwithstanding, he seemed to think I would be quite useful to have on board, and so began my association with the highs and lows of Watsonian cricket. There have been many memories involving many individuals over 16 years, and I have broken outstanding ones into three headings, events and incidents, bowling, and batting. I said my introduction, my main involvement in sport has been in dealing with sports injuries. While injuries do occur in cricket, fortunately not many are serious. However, there are exceptions. A cricket ball travelling at high speed is a dangerous missile. An evening Masterton Cup match at my side with Watsonians batting and Gordon Drummond on strike, hit a powerful shot straight down the wicket, and veteran umpire Sandy Scotland, standing at the bowler's end, was unable to get out of the way and was struck a severe blow on his forehead, which resulted in a fairly serious injury which troubled him for some time. In a similar ball incident, Stuart Chalmers was struck on the side of the face, resulting in a fractured cheekbone and several weeks' discomfort. James Easton and D. Wald Nell both sustained serious shoulder injuries in the act of rolling over while fielding. All sport has highs and lows. Two lows come readily to mind. Both involved the final of the Scottish Cup. The first losing to Harriet's at Titwood when we were outbatted on the day, and more recently losing to Carlton at Fort Hill in a game where we were in a strong position and should have won. Two highs, winning the overall Scottish League in I think 2012 by defeating Dumfries at Grange Loan, and in 2018, winning the Mulgatroyd final, beating Clydesdale in a match at Stirling, which had been carried over from the previous season because of waterlock pitches at Pollock. This followed a previous unsuccessful attempt to win this trophy when we lost in the final to Forfarshire. Over the years I have been involved, I consider bowling has been stronger than batting. There have been occasions when every member of the team, including the keeper, could have bowled if required. One of particular mention, amongst many, are Steve Page, against Grange at Meyer's side, on a cloudy day when the new ball really moved about early on, and we skittled out the manor place men for a very low total. 
Top order batsman Yoon Chalmers taking five for not very many against Aberdeenshire at Manorfield. He later said he would rather have scored more runs on the day. Craig Wright bowling his floaters, demolishing the Carlton tail end to achieve a rare win at Grange Lone. Paddy Sadler, all arms and legs, storming in from the town end, and Stuart Chalmers with the grunts getting ever louder, demolishing a very good Arbroath team for a low total at Lachlan's. And finally Andy Mackay with an amazing performance against Grange at Manor Place to achieve figures of 9 for 9, something which might never be achieved, achieved again and one of the officiating umpires commenting afterwards that he had never seen bowling of that calibre before. Over the years, in-depth batting for Watsonians has been something of a problem. Having said that, there have been many fine knocks along the way. James Henderson was a pleasure to watch. Head down, slow to start, but very few failures, and a prolific scorer. The late Willie Morton once said of him, you don't realise how many he is making until you look at the scoreboard. Over the years, Ewan Chalmers has been the backbone of batting and has had many fine knocks along the way. James Easton delight at scoring his maiden hundred in a win against Harriet's at Golden Acre, after having something of a lean spell for quite a long time. Andrew Chalmers mighty hitting and dispatching the ball several times onto the road against Arbroath at Wachlands, no mean feat. Mike Carson and George Munsey destroying the Falkland attack and creating a league record score at Falkland. Colin Sillers, not a batsman of any great note, but dispatching a four from the final ball of the game to defeat Aberdeen at Manorfield. However, I think pride of face must go to Alex Sim. Again, not a noted top order batsman. On the day, opened the batting and remained throughout the innings in a formidable achievement given that he was recovering from a family tragedy and in doing so achieved a win against Forfarshire at Myerside. Anyone following cricket in Scotland has to accept the vagaries of the weather. Watching a match on a sunny afternoon can be a very pleasant experience, but there are exceptions. One in particular comes to mind. A Scottish Cup match played against Stonywood Dice at People's Park. Always an interesting place to go, especially if you enjoy aircraft spotting at close range. On this particular Sunday afternoon, with weather more akin to mid-January than midsummer, the hardy men of the North East prevailed. My wife saying afterwards, I am never going to cricket again. However, she relented, and since then we have spent many expanded weekends in such places as Greenock, Ayr, Dumfries, Aberdeen, Forfarshire and Arbroath. Thank you for the memories.